Today we kick off part two of our new series, Who Needs God? And this series has been different than any series I have ever done before because last week we started the series and I told you that the series really isn't a series, it's really one sermon, right? It's one message that's kind of chopped up over four weeks. But the reality is, is that no one wants to sit here for two hours and have me give the message all at once. And so what we've decided to do as a team is just take a component of one, really one message and teach it to you each part of the week. And so last week we talked about this, that a step away from one thing is a step toward something else. A step away from one thing is a step towards something else. And, and while many of us have kind of wondered, what do we believe about God? What, where does faith and doubt, like what's the intersection of that? How does all of this stuff work? We, we talked last week about the fact that if we step away from faith, we are, we're glad to do that. You're, you're glad to do that. If that's a step that you feel like you're called to do. But a step away from faith leads to a step towards something that leads to some unsettling conclusions. And so last week I talked about the new atheism for the, the smart guys like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawking and Sam Harris, the people who really propose that God is actually part of the problem, that religion is the issue, and it would be best for all of us if we just walked away from religion and embraced this worldview. But the problem with that worldview is that, that in that worldview, a worldview where there is no God, you really can't define yourself. There is no you. There is no justice, and there really is no meaning, which is unsettling. But let's be honest, religion has some unsettling conclusions as well, doesn't it? Christianity has some unsettling conclusions as well. One of those unsettling conclusions is that, you know, people who don't trust or follow Jesus uh, will end up spending an eternity apart from God. That's an unsettling conclusion. And like we talked about, just because something is unsettling doesn't necessarily mean it is untrue. Perfect example of that. Your son's or your daughter's boyfriend, right? It's unsettling that, that he's there, but, but it doesn't mean that it's not true, right? That's the whole point. And so we talked last week about how 23% of North Americans fall into a new category. That the 23% of North American adults have moved away from church and established religion and faith. And, and there's a name that's been used now to describe who these people are. They are called the nuns. And the nuns reflect 56 million adults in the United States of America, about a quarter of our population. And one third of adults in the United States um, between the ages of 18 to 35 would identify as religiously unaffiliated, meaning religion is no longer an important part of their life. In fact, they might even say that religion is a problem. And so why are we talking about stuff like this in church? Why are we having this conversation? For two reasons. One, some of us are here simply because we're interested in faith, but we're not sure if we believe. Some of us are considering walking away from faith altogether, but our husband or our wife keeps on dragging us. Our kids need to get some dose of religion, so we drop them off, and it's free childcare for like an hour and change, and we can sit and kind of endure the talk or whatever it might be to, to get a little bit of rest. For some of us, that's the reason why. For many of us, the reason why this content is so important is because someone you love or you know finally has a category. They're a nun. They, they no longer believe in the faith of their childhood, and you've tried to engage them in conversations, but you don't know where to start because the worldview is so different, and so we just want to take some time aside to equip all of us, parents, especially those of you who have kids who are in high school or beginning to move towards college. We want to equip everyone in the room, everyone who's a part of our church, to engage in the reality of the conversation of spirituality in North America, which is this. God is no longer the center point of what matters most to many of us. What's interesting, what's interesting about the new atheism, what's interesting about the nuns, you know, a category that maybe you fall into, a category I fell into for a portion of my life, is that most nuns are not deciding that atheism is where they land. Because atheism has some really unsettling conclusions like we talked about. Most nuns have decided that they're not religious, they're just spiritual. 68% or so two-thirds would identify as spiritual. And here's why. Is because while atheism has unsettling conclusions, so does religion. So there's a rock and a hard place. Do I pick the despair of atheism or do I pick the doubt of the religion of my childhood? It would be just be better to kind of fall into this category of seeking and being spiritual. And for many of us, including me, for a season of my life, what we realize is this, is that while we've given up on our childhood faith, we aren't convinced of the alternative. While we are walking away from the, the church of our childhood, the faith of our childhood, the religion that we grew up with, we're just not convinced that the alternative is all that appealing or even true. Which begs this question, what happened? What happened? Well, I am kind of nerdy and I really enjoy 
asking that question and seeing it through the lens of people that have deconverted from Christianity. And re remember, I have, I'm pursuing a doctorate in theology, not a doctorate in biology, right? So these are things that I'm, I'm really interested in. But the deconversion stories of people that used to be Christians that are no longer Christians are really exciting to me. And I'm not going to talk about all religion today because I don't know all religion, but, but I want to talk about the people that stepped away from Christian faith. And what's so interesting is when I read the stories and I watch the you know, YouTube videos and I, when I pick up the articles, the reason why people walk away from Christian faith, for the most part, are reasons I think that they should walk away from Christian faith. Because the God that they're talking about when they're writing or when they're talking or when they're discussing, the reason why they deconverted is a God that I believe isn't worth believing in either. I don't even think it's the God of the Bible. But the deconversion stories all kind of have a similar rhythm. Different contexts, different names, different people, but there's a rhythm that exists. And maybe you'll find yourself in it. Deconversion stories look like this. Grew up in a religious household. So if you were like me, that looked like you had a grandma who made sure you were at church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and Saturday too, because the pastor needed help, right? Like that's how I grew up, right? Every waking moment was church. And when I spent my summers with my grandmother who's from Jamaica, that meant um, Saturday church as well with a suit in Fort Lauderdale in the summer with no air conditioning for four hours, all right? That was the morning, right? Y'all think an hour 15 is long. Just come back to my black church growing up and y'all calm down, all right? That's what it was like. So I grew up in a religious household. Maybe you did as well. And then you entered the real world. And as you entered the real world, there are questions you had that you, you couldn't really find answers with in your Christian faith or the church that you grew up in. And as you enter the real world, you realize that some of the people that, that said things when you were growing up to, in church that you believed were, were kind of crazy, right? Because you actually met the mean, evil, bad people that they were talking about. And some of those people were nicer than the people that were talking about them, right? You know what I'm talking about? I remember um, reading a book that just really, really kind of messed with me. It was a book um, called... Um, um, a, a seat at the table with, with Drew Harper, and Drew is a, um, a, a self-pronounced gay atheist who grew up with an evangelical dad who's a professor and a pastor at a church. And Drew said that he grew up believing that Muslims were this particular way because that's what everybody told him. And then he did a study abroad trip, and he went to Egypt, and he hung out with uh, some people that were culturally Muslim, and they were fun, and they partied really well, and they were really, really nice, and he realized the version of Islam that was shared with him at his church was nothing like the real world version that he was experiencing in real life. And at some point, you enter the real world. Maybe it's college. Maybe it's adulthood. Maybe it's your first job. And you experience a faith-shaking moment. And that faith-shaking moment might be something like you prayed really hard and something didn't happen the way that, you know, your grandmama said it would if you, as long as you prayed. Or maybe the faith-shaking moment came because you heard something and, and all of a sudden you had to wrestle with this chemistry class and what you grew up le learning about and chemistry and Genesis didn't seem to make a ton of sense. You had to pick one in order to kind of live and, and you ended up maybe struggling with faith at that point. And eventually what happens is that our childhood faith slowly began to erode. And the stuff we grew up believing, and the stuff we were convinced of when we were eight just no longer held water when we were 18 or 28. And maybe like you, you felt like one person who deconverted. His name's Kenneth Nahigian, who said this, that to go on affirming something I did not believe would be like telling myself that two plus two equals five. I could not do it and stay sane. And I think that word could not is so important because I think sometimes in Christian circles, especially in church world, we can have this idea or expectation that the reason why people walk away from faith is because they want to. But belief doesn't work that way. You can't force yourself to believe things you do not believe. That most people that walk away from faith have walked away from faith not because they wanted to, but because they could no longer rationalize the God of their childhood or the faith of their childhood with the real world they were living in and they had to pick one and two plus two equals four. It doesn't equal five. And for, I think for a lot of us, at the same time we were learning to use our imagination, at the same time we were learning about Santa Claus and you know, the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny, we were learning about God. But eventually we grew up and the perspective we had about Santa and the Easter Bunny, they changed, right? And, and if you're 35 and your perspective of those things haven't changed, we should have another conversation. But for all of us, those things changed. And when we enter in the real world, the flannel board faith we grew up with just did not hold water. 
with technology and anthropology and the real world. Because we began to ask fact-based questions, but those fact-based questions were met with faith-based answers. And eventually, eventually, the longer we asked those questions and the cheaper the answers were that we got from our church or our childhood faith, our faith began to feel more like a fairy tale. And as one young woman who grew up in church her whole life, was on a worship team, gave her life to ministry, would say that when she stopped believing in God, it was better because it's much better than believing in fairy tales. And I want to talk to you today about the fairy tale gods. That for most of us, the gods that we've considered walking away from or the gods that we have walked away from, I want you to hear me, those gods are gods worth leaving. Most of the gods we left were gods worth leaving. And I want to kind of leave us with this question that might create some tension in the room, and I hope that it does, is that maybe, maybe the version of God that we left wasn't God in the first place. Now, your step away from God at some point or the version of God that you grew up with as a kid or the version of God that you grew up with in high school or college, the step away from that God might actually be the step that you needed to take to be able to step towards the actual God. And I know that it's arrogant, but I, but I want you to just lean in and, and, and see what we're talking about today. Because for some of us, we believe, but we wonder. We believe in God, but we wonder, how do I rationalize a world I can taste, touch, and see with a God that seems to be unseeable? For many of us, we wonder how anyone in the world can believe this stuff in the first place. It's the 21st century, people. And that religion is the problem. We need to let go of it because religion is what causes wars. Religion, in the words of Richard Dawkins, is what makes good people do evil things. If we just got rid of religion, it would be good. But you're still here. And you're here because there's a part of you that realizes that the, the antithesis of religion isn't appealing either. And you just wonder how anyone can believe. And for a percentage of us, we just wonder how or if will ever be able to believe again, because there was a time. There was a time when God seemed real. There was a time when God felt close. There was a time when we believed. And we're just wondering, can we get back to that? And so last week, we talked about um, the alternative to faith. And this week, what I want to talk about are the gods that you walked away from, that you should walk away from, the fairy tale gods that are worth leaving. So there's a list of them. And as we begin that list, I want to kind of give you a confession that as you go through this list, there's going to be a couple of emotions that you feel. For some of us that are really religious, for some of us who are really, really dogmatic, we're going to struggle a little bit with this message because I'm going to step on the version of faith that you hold on to the most. But I want to encourage you to realize that the God, if you're a Christian, the God that we worship is so much bigger than your small preference of how you experience him. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is that when we talk about these little fairy tale gods that we all grew up with. There's a, there's a level of ownership that the church has to take on for this. But the reason why you walked away from faith is not because Jesus is not compelling. It's because the way that we have talked about Jesus is not compelling. And so, as you lean into this conversation, understand this reality. This is my confession for all of us. Is that the fairy tale gods we grew up with were usually a result of well-intended, poorly executed parenting and preaching. Because somebody told you about God, didn't they? I remember um, when I was about you know, seven or eight years old, um, I was at my grandmother's house in South Florida. Uh, she's a Jamaican woman. I love her to pieces. She's, she's really deep spiritual. Like when the woman prays, it feel, you, you feel like she's just got like a direct line. You know, it's kind of like, I want you to pray about me getting into college. Like that, that, that's the kind of like, you know, woman that she is. She's a well-intending woman, but, but sometimes the answers that she gave when I was a kid, it kind of actually messed me up in a big way. So I was like seven or eight years old, and I asked my grandmother, grandmother, why does it rain and thunderstorm every single afternoon in the summer when we're living in Miami? Like, I want to go outside and play, but I can never go outside and play around 3 o'clock because it's always thundering and raining. And my grandmother's response to me in this thick Jamaican accent, um, she would lean into me and she'd say, well, Colin, she'd say, Colin, the reason why it rains so much every day is because God is crying about all the terrible things you do. And the reason why you hear thunder crackling in the background is because he's screaming at pain and all of the hurtful things you do when you disrespect your grandmother. <laughs> and then she walked out of the room. <laughs> and I thought, oh man, I must be a really bad person because it rains a lot and there's a lot of thunder. <laughs> 
But here's the deal. My operative version of why are there thunderstorms in South Florida was built on that idea until I got a little bit older. But this is the same woman who I trusted for everything. This is the same woman who I believed had all of the answers. And when our faith-based or fact-based questions get faith-based answers at some point, the faith of our childhood just falls flat. So what are the fairy tale gods? Here's the first fairy tale god I want to talk about. The first fairy tale god I want to talk about is bodyguard god. Bodyguard God. And I'm going to borrow some of this language from Andy Stanley. He has a great talk on this content, and, and uh, we're, we're borrowing some from him today. He says that Bodyguard God says, I will never let you or the people you love experience pain. And that's a version of God that maybe some of us grew up with. That if I just pray, and if I'm just good enough, that I'll be okay, right? Because the safest place to be is in the center of God's will, amen, right? Like, didn't you grow up with that? Yeah. Except the problem is, is that the safest place to be necessarily isn't always the center of God's will. And if it is, and what this is the problem that we all face, is that pain happens even when we ask for it not to happen. We show up to church every Sunday. We write our tithe check. We even volunteer with kids, and we don't even like kids. And yet, when we ask God to meet us in our place of pain or for a person that we care about, it seems like even sometimes when we pray, the pain gets worse. It never gets better. And we grew up with a version of bodyguard God that, if I'm honest, is cheap preaching, but not the God of the Bible. And here's how we know that, is that Christian faith is built off of the premise of a very bad thing happening to a very good person. If there was anyone who was in the center of God's will, it would have been a man by the name of Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified by Rome, suffocated until he died, and was thrown into a tomb to take on a sinner's death. That is the premise of what we believe. And if that was the case, if Christian faith was built off of bodyguard God, the problem with that, simply put, would be that no person who lived in the first century would have believed in that God in the first place because every single major spokesperson and voice for the Christian faith in the first century died horrific deaths, not because they were saying that Jesus was a good guy, but that they had seen him rise. If the premise of Christian faith is as long as you do what God wants you to do, he's going to keep you safe. That is a premise that does not exist in the New Testament or in the first century church, but yet it's a version of faith we grew up with. And if you walked away from bodyguard God, good, good. That is a figment of our imagination. Bodyguard God does not exist. Paul would put it this way in 2 Corinthians 1. He said, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. The story of Christian faith is not that God's going to protect you from hard things happening. The story of Christian faith is that God is going to allow those hard things to be used for a purpose. That pain in the Christian life is unavoidable, but it is purposeful. But we learned about bodyguard God. And bodyguard God does not exist. If you still believe in bodyguard God, you should walk away from it because it is not real. Here's the second God. Campfire God. Campfire God says, you'll always feel my presence. Campfire God looks like that moment you had when you were like 13 years old and you went to summer camp. And the reason why you went to summer camp is because your best friend went or because the cute girl went and you thought you'd go there, right? And like become a Christian so you could date her, right? All that whole thing. Oh, just my story. Okay, cool. Um, anyways. <laughs> Campfire God, right? It's the version of God when we're in middle school or high school. Like we have these, these moments, maybe it was in college, right? And the song was just right. You know, the, the, the guitar player played C sharp just right. The lighting was great. The, 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 the fog and the haze just hit just right, you know? And you're like, I'm thinking I'm experiencing God right now. Everybody else has their hands up in the air and you kind of just feel your hands doing a little, a little levitation thing. You don't even know what's going on. You're like, it must be God, right? Like that, that experience. And some of us grew up with a version of faith that said, if you want to know that God is real, don't worry. God's always there. You're always going to feel him. He's always going to be there for you. But then there hit a moment in your life when you stopped feeling him, <laughs> right? You felt him every fall and every summer when you went to camp, but that was about it. And then you chase church after church after church, trying to find the church that's going to sing the right worship song so you can feel God again. And you can't. And the problem with this is that we cannot and do not always feel God. In fact, that's not even the story of the Bible. We'll get to that in a moment. 
But when I, when I read these words that I'm about to put on the screen, these words in many ways reflect how I feel sometimes about faith as a pastor and maybe the way that you felt as well. It's written this way. It says, in my soul, I feel just that terrible pain of loss, of God not wanting me, of God not being God, of God not really existing. There are times, right, when it's just hard, when you don't feel them like you did in 88, to wonder if he's still real and if he's still there. And these words weren't written by Christopher Hitchens. They weren't written by Richard Dawkins. They weren't written by a new atheist. These words were written by one of the greatest people to probably have ever walked the face of the earth, a person who was committed to her faith, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa wrote these words while she was serving in Calcutta, and she would say that there would be long seasons of her life where she would hear from God and then not hear from him for a long, long time, and she would feel a sense of emptiness. But it never sh shaked or rattled her faith to a point where she walked away from it, because Mother Teresa knew what, what many of us hopefully do know, is that campfire God is a figment of our imagination. Campfire God does not exist. And if I could push a little bit more here, I think it's so important for those of us that kind of live in this world to realize that our awareness of something does not determine whether it is real or true. Like right now, right now, you are traveling 67,000 miles. You're rotating 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. But you don't feel that, do you? But it doesn't change the fact that it's true or it's real. We are often most unaware of the realest things that are occurring. None of us woke up this morning and said, man, I feel American. Do you feel American? No one did that, right? America, no one did that. But for most of us, it's, it's our citizenship. So the idea that if I can't feel God, it means that God is not there is a ridiculous assertion. But it's one that many of us grew up with. And if that's the God that you grew up with, I would invite you to walk away from that God because campfire God is not real. It made youth group fun, but you are an adult and it is time to grow up. Here's a third one, on-demand God. On-demand God says, I will come through the way you would expect me to. Like for many of us, our perspective of God is simply this. God, surely you would do for me what I would do for someone else. God, I'm just praying for a date. And it's because, God, I want to love a woman the way that you wanted a man to love a woman. I want to lay my life down for her like Christ laid her life down, or laid his life down for the church. And I'm tired of being lonely. So, God, would you just give me a date? And then he doesn't. Or a parent. And we're like, God, would you please stop my child from dating that person, right? That's the prayer we're praying. Why? Because surely we think God would do for us what we think would be reasonable and fine to do. So the problem is we've prayed and we've heard nothing. We've asked and we've seen nothing change. And on-demand God, I think, is really tied to the American dream. I think it's the most comfortable, easy, suburban God to communicate, because it's really easy preaching for me to say, if you just ask, God's going to give it to you. If you just trust, God's going to give you everything that you want. And let me take a bumper sticker Bible verse that's way out of context and prove my point so that you can go home feeling good for about 30 minutes, and we'll see you next Sunday, right? And that's the majority of the teaching that we grew up with in church. But let me ask you this. Who told you God existed to do what you wanted him to do in the first place? Who, who told you that, that you are the center of the universe and that God exists like Robin Williams in Aladdin uh, to be a blue genie where you get to rub the lamp and get the wishes you want? Who told you that's who God is? Because that's not the God of the Bible. And we know it's not the God of the Bible because the Bible says it's not the God of the Bible. Job says this in Job 3.10, I cry to you for help and you do not answer me. I stand and you only look at me. He says, David writes this in Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, I find no rest. These are the same words Jesus would say when he's hanging on a tree. He'd say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do I not feel you? Why are you not doing what I want you to do when I want you to do it? Why are you allowing these bad things to happen to me? Why are you allowing bad things to happen to people I care about? God, if you were anything like me, and I'm not even God, I'm just a decent person. If you were decent, surely you would just give me what I'm asking you to do if you have all the power in the world. But who told you 
that what you want God to be is what God is. And who told us that if we just ask God for things, he's morally responsible to do it for us. And for a moment, let's be honest, we're really thankful God didn't give us all the things that we asked him for anyway, because you'd still be, you'd end up being married to that person that you saw on Facebook that you're really happy you're not married to anymore, right? If God gave us everything we wanted, come on, come on. The things that we think we want the most sometimes are the things that we need the least. Think about Tim Keller. He says that we would ask God to do what God does every time if we knew and could see what God knows. So on demand God. If that's the God you believe in or that's the God you walked away from, walk away from it because it is a figment of an imagination. It does not exist. Now the next one we're going to talk about is the one that probably... Um, probably, I think, uh, frustrates me the most, um, because this is part of my story. It's the reason why I walked away from faith for a season of time in my life. And, and I think so much of it had to do with the upbringing and the environment that I was in. But, but the next God that I want us to talk about, the God you should walk away from, is anti-science God. Anti-science God says, if faith and science seem to differ, deny science for faith. So when I was in fifth grade, um, I was, it was 1999, so I'm dating myself, right? Don't judge me. When, when I was in fifth grade, um, Y2K was a really big thing. Do you guys remember Y2K? Yeah, that's incredible. Some of you guys weren't even born then, but Y2K, there was, there was a time when people were freaking out about the whole world coming to an end. And, and I remember I was in fifth grade at this private Christian school, and as I went to this private Christian school, uh, we were about to leave for Christmas break, and I walked up to my teacher, Mr. Parker, and I said, Mr. Parker, can't wait to see you next spring in the new millennium. Kind of gave him a little nod. And he looked at me deadpan, and he said, Colin... Um, God is coming back on New Year's Eve, so I will not be seeing you unless you repent and are in heaven. And then he, he left. Like, that was like, have a good Christmas break, everybody. So like, so, like, Christmas comes by, right? And I'm trying to be, like, extra nice, like, to my siblings, like, at this moment, you know, to my parents. I'm, I'm no joke. I remember seeing the clock begin to, like, you know, drop down, kind of clock, you know, 10, 9. And at that point, I'm like, God, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry. Like, I'm just, like, list of things. Like, I'm, I'm asking God to forgive me for things. I don't think I actually did. But in just in case, like, I'm, I'm giving it to him, right? And then, the, like, I close my eyes when the ball drops, like, getting ready to, like, either go up or down. I don't know which way the elevator's going, but I'm just, like, getting ready for it. The ball drops. And I open my eyes. And I'm like, shoot. It hasn't happened in California yet. And so I ended up spending the next three hours continuing to ask God to forgive me for all of the things that I had done or hadn't done. And then I show up, spring of 2000, and Mr. Parker's there, and I am too. <laughs> and my faith began to erode because there was science that said that the world was going to end, and it didn't. Here's the problem with anti-science God. Is that anti-science God is really convenient for people who don't understand science to try to rule things away so that they can have faith, okay? But here's the problem with that. When it matters most, we're more likely to trust undeniable science than unreliable faith. <laughs> and if you're not a Christian, you're maybe a, a nun or skeptic, not sure, this is great ammunition for you when you relate to Christians who want to talk big about their faith and all this kind of stuff. Oh, like, yeah, that's great. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. When your kid gets sick, or someone you love gets sick, guess who you're not calling? You're not calling me, right? No, you're calling a doctor. And you expect when you go to that doctor's office and you pay your copay, that they're going to have a natural solution for the natural issues that your child is facing. And you're going to sit by the phone. You're going to wait for that phone call to come. You have your friends praying, of course, but you are waiting on the phone call. And when you get the phone call, right, from the doctor, you're not expecting to hear something like this. Well, uh, Mr. Outerbridge, we, uh, we went through the labs. We took a, like, took, you know, took, a, 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 took a biopsy of things, kind of checked things out. We've, we've really kind of studied everything that's there. And, and the biggest and the best conclusion we can come to based upon the data is that God is really trying to teach you something, right? Like, is that, is that our expectation? <laughs> no, because we want real answers to real questions. So why in the world are we okay with science helping us with our health, but in some way think that we cannot trust science in other areas? It's hypocritical. It's a joke. And if anti-science God is the God that you walked away from, good. Good. 
because that's the God I walked away from. And when I walked away from that God, I found an actual God, an actual God who is able to not be afraid by what science is showing us, to, that's not afraid of how science allows us to move forward in advancement, a God who actually put all that stuff into motion. And here's what's so interesting, I think, is that we grow up in a culture and an environment that tells us that sometimes science and God, that those things conflict. We've got to pick one or, or the other, right? We've got to pick undeniable science or unreliable faith. But here's the thing. Science and Christianity are not incompatible. In fact, modern science was pioneered by what Christians believed about God. Before Christianity, the predominant way the world thought that, that, that you know, things happened and the world existed was through a pantheon of gods who were emotional, who made decisions on a whim, which meant there was nothing that could be studied because Jupiter was going to decide what Jupiter was going to do, and Aphrodite was going to decide what she was going to do, and Zeus was going to decide what he was going to do. The birth of the modern science movement was a result of Christian faith, and somehow, we have allowed in our churches over the last 30 years to stop talking about that reality and lean on things that are not holistic in helping people answer the real questions they have about how the world began and how things function and operate. Christian theology was the first to assume that God created a universe that is rational, lawful, and stable, which means it can be studied. It's why when I read the Genesis account and I see on the seventh day that God rested, it makes perfect sense to me that God could have started and kicked everything off in motion and took a step back. And we have science to understand how he did it in the first place. You don't have to walk away from science in order to become a follower of Jesus. And you don't need to walk away from Jesus because science has some things to prove. And in a lot of ways, that's what culture has taught us. And it's convenient both for Christians and it's convenient for those who aren't. Because it's really easy to say, to be a Christian means you've got to check your mind at the door. Because there's a little song that goes this way. In, hmm, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Correct. And we know that the world was a sphere, it was round, not flat. And for the longest time, people have been saying that Christians held to this view of a flat earth. Did you know 800 years before Christopher Columbus ever sailed the ocean blue, there was a Christian philosopher by the name of Bede who was saying that the world was round, that Nicholas Copernicus was taught by Christian scholars who said that the world was a sphere, and yet... You went to college and heard that Christians held on to a flat earth theory until the 15th, 16th, or 17th century, and it's just not true. Christians were talking about and understood that the world was a sphere far before modern science ever believed that to be the case. They were on the forefront of their ignorance, and Christians to this day still need to be that way. Dr. Francis Collins, who's the founder of the director of the Human Genome Project, says this, I found there's a wonderful harmony and the complementary truths of science and faith. By investigating God's majestic and awesome creation, science can actually be a means of worship. So if you walked away from faith because of anti-science God, you walked away from a God who is worth walking away from. Here's the one that I think is the hardest to walk away from, and those of us that have walked away from it still find that it plagues us a little bit, is guilt God. Guilt God says, keep your religious leader's version of the rules or suffer the consequences. Here's the problem. Guilt and fear modify behavior until we have the freedom to do what we want to do anyway, which is my story. I feel in a lot of ways I grew up with a guilt and fear version of God that it was Jesus plus my good works that would make me good enough for him. And in a lot of ways, I felt like the list of rules and regulations were way too many to be able to finish of why in the world would I try in the first place. And the reason why I think guilt guard is the easiest one to walk away from but the hardest one to fully divorce ourselves from is because you walked away from guilt guard a long time ago and yet you still every now and then feel a little bit guilty, don't you? <laughs> yeah. But guilt God is not the God of the Bible. Guilt God is not the God of Jesus. In fact, Romans 8 verse 1 would tell us that there therefore is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. That Paul, historic Paul, not a fairy tale version, but a Paul who everyone agrees wrote the book of Romans, would give us this perspective on Christian faith, that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. The, the, the Christian faith is not built off a premise of guilt and fear. It is actually built off the direct opposite of that, but love and freedom. But so many of us grew up in churches and, and in families and in homes 
that taught us rules instead of grace. And let's be honest, rules are a lot easier to follow. And if we're parents, it's a lot easier to guilt our kids into doing what we want them to do for a moment of time than it is to be patient with them and allow them to grow and develop and make mistakes and give them grace. And we oftentimes pr propagate this version of God to our kids without them even realizing it's happening. Because did you know, dads, that the primary picture that your kid has of who God is is going to be you? And that guilt God might be the God that we pick because it's just a lot easier. And I want you to know that that God is a God worth walking away from. So if you walked away from guilt God, congratulations, you made the right decision. The last one I want to talk about is the one that probably annoys me the most. Um, it's Gap God. Uh, Gap God is um, kind of a fill-in-the-blank God. Gap God says this, if you can't explain it, it must be God, you know? It's like you're driving through a mall and it's packed and a space opens up and you say, oh, God gave me the space. And it's like, ah. Or maybe the person just backed out of the car, right? Like backed out of the, the space, right? It's like everything is chalked up to a God thing, you know? It's like you, you're praying that Whole Foods like still has that almond milk you really need, or at least that's my prayer, right? And you walk in and there's only one left and it's like, God has taken care of me, right? And, and I want you to know, the argument for God that there is a God because there are things we cannot explain is probably the weakest, for lack of a better term, dumbest argument a person can make. And here's the reason why. The list of what we don't know is shortening and things we are uncertain of will eventually become certain. And we want that to be the case, don't we? We want there to be breakthroughs in medical science. No one's sitting around saying, you know what? I don't want that disease healed because that proves that God exists, right? No one's saying that. But when we use this fill the gap God version, which is so easy to lean on, it's so easy to, to say that that's the version of God that we need to believe in, what we realize is that we're building a theology that eventually is going to be disproved because the things that we cannot explain will one day be explainable. So gap God needs to go away. Because here's what I think is true. It isn't what we don't know that proves the existence of God. It's what we already know that does. Like Christians, we don't have to be afraid of science answering the questions we don't have answers to. We don't have to be afraid of philosophers answering questions that we don't have answers to. We don't need to be afraid of more study of the brain helping us understand why we are the way that we are and why we relate to one another the way that we relate to one another. No one needs to be afraid of that because science is not the big bad wolf who's going to, you know, blow our little faith house away. It's a ridiculous idea. Because proof that God exists is not found in what we don't know. It's found in what we already know. Because as science explains to us what and how, faith is just why. That's why people like Sir Fred Hoyle, who's the guy who coined the term Big Bang Theory, the one who coined the idea of, of what would be kind of colloquially used to describe this idea of singularity, that the world all began from an individual moment. And from this moment, all of uh, matter and physics and mass, all, all, all time, space, and ma matter, time, space, and matter, all of the things that create the world today, all of those things, Sir Fred Hoyle writes this, that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and biology. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Carl Sagan believed that there are only two reasons or two things that need to be apparent for there to be life that, sustain, that could be sustained in the universe. And while Carl Sagan said that in 1948, we now know that there are at least 2,000 things that have to be in place for life to be sustained. And when you even look at singularity, so let's, let's, just, let's just say for a minute, I'm just going to give you this argument, okay? Because I don't even know if it's worth arguing. I'm going to give you the argument that singularity and a big bang is the way in which all of the universe started, okay? And some of you really religious fundamental people are getting really nervous right now. Calm down. It is okay, all right? Save the email. But like, let's just, let's just start there for a second, all right? Let's assume singularity. Let's assume it all happened in a moment, okay? Sir Fred Hoyle did this research. Paul Davies has done this research. And they would say that for all of these things to happen just the right way, for every condition to be just right in order for the universe to be able to sustain life as we know it, would be one in a quintillion. That is 10 times 18 zeros on the back end. 10 times 18 zeros on the back end. So tell me what is more rational and realistic, that one in... A quintillion is what occurred for the, the complexity, the digital elegance of DNA, as Francis Collin calls it. All of these things that have happened 
to allow us to live in the Goldilocks circle where we're just far away from the sun where it's not too hot, not too cold, right? Goldilocks, get it? To sustain life. <laughs> that, that the one in quintillion chance happened by chance or that maybe there was a designer, then maybe the fact that 40% of the people that research and study this stuff conclude that there's at least an intelligent designer, and even a higher percentage of that believe in intelligent design who may not even believe in faith or ascribe to a religion. That's why Dr. John Lennox says this, the more we get to know, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. So we don't need to be afraid of more things being discovered. We don't need to be afraid of more things like, you know, being uncovered about how the world works and worry that faith is going to go as a result. No, it's the things that are discoverable and that are known that make the case even more compelling that a God exists. And if you walked away from fill the gap, God, because you woke up one day and thought, that's ridiculous that we're ascribing everything that we can't explain to God, and that's not a good reason for God to exist, and I'm walking away, good job walking away, because that is a God worth walking away from. So which fairy tale God did you once believe and you now need to leave? Because there are some of us who haven't walked away who are still believing in one of the fairy tale gods I just talked about. And let me tell you, you need to walk away from that God. You need to walk away from that God. Which fairy tale God was it? Was it bodyguard God? Was it campfire God? Was it on-demand God? Was it anti-science God? Was it guilt God? Or was it gap God? Maybe there's another one. But here's the thing. Why do we learn about these gods as kids? Why is it that this is the flannel board faith that we grew up in? Why is it that this is the faith of our Sunday school, the faith of our religious fundamentalist home, the faith of our grandparents? Why is this the version of faith that we grew up with? Well, I want to confess something to you. It's the church's fault. It's easier and cheaper and a far less hard work to prep a sermon and assume that we all agree on stuff and never ask the hard questions or never answer the tough questions than it is to dig in deep and wade through the mess with people. And eventually, the version of faith you get is hollow and thin. And it's a joke. And the reason why you grew up with this version of childhood God with your parents, it's not because your parents were terrible people. It's not because your parents wanted you to have this horrible experience where your childhood faith would collide with real life and you'd have to walk away from one of them and most of us walked away from our childhood faith. And here's how I know this. Because I have kids now. Right? And I'm well intended with them but sometimes my explanations are not the best. And I'll give you a great example of this. Where do babies come from? Where do babies come from? It depends on who is asking. So for my three-year-old, my two-year-old Jackson who's going to be three, for my five-year-old who's going to be six, at least, mommy's tummy was an okay answer for a while. But for my eight-year-old Emma, mommy's tummy is no longer a sufficient answer. And many of us grew up and walked away from the fairy tales of our childhood but left ourselves with or found ourselves left with a mommy's tummy faith that did not and cannot survive the realities of the real world because we accommodate to a person's capacity and for some of us the church we grew up in the family dynamic we had the religious environment that we were a part of gave us faith-based answers to fact-based questions, and one day we just walked away for the childhood version of God that we had. And so hear me, if you walked away from a fairy tale God that didn't make sense in the real world, good. You should walk away from that kind of God. But your step away from a fairy tale God might be a step toward the real one. One that is capable of helping us walk through an adult world with adult questions. And that's the conversation we're going to have next week.